Some months ago, I came across a book entitled Time Changer. It's a novel, but a Christian novel, about a uh, college professor who writes a book, and then he goes into the future to find out how his book has affected society. Well, eventually, this book was made into a movie, and uh, Gavin McLeod is uh, one of the characters in this movie, and uh, it went into... Uh, various movie theaters around the country. This is the VHS version, and this is the DVD version. Uh, we want to offer you this movie uh, over the next few weeks as we talk about this titillating subject, Time Travelers of the Bible. And to introduce this, of course, I want you to see just a clip from this movie. It is 1890, and for one Bible professor, the times are changing. Records are showing that over 5% of marriages end in divorce. But he's about to discover... Paris, what is happening? Things could be a lot worse. October 21st, 2000. Now, in the 21st century... You must have come in on a long trip, huh? One could say that. Russell Carlyle will come face to face oh my. with a future he never imagined. Young lady, you do understand that stealing is a sin. Says who? And the only way he can make a difference. This is an extremely critical time for the church. Is to turn back the clock. We're going to find out what's going on. D. David Morin, Gavin McLeod, Hal Linden, Jennifer O'Neill, and Paul Rodriguez. What are you, man? Some kind of preacher? In a rich Cristiano film. What's wrong with you? You've been living in 1890? Or something? Time changer. You must see for yourself what happens in the future. It's an amazing clip. Uh, you know, uh, Gary Stimmen is here to discuss with me the idea of time travel. Hmm. Time travel, an intriguing topic, I'm sure you'll agree. Novels have been written about it, uh, scientific treatises have been written about it. But uh, our interest is in the Bible, and JR, what we discover from reading the Bible is that there are time travelers. Uh, of the Bible, and they demonstrate one principle, which is that God is the author of time. He is the gatekeeper of time. And when, when we discuss time travel, we cannot avoid discussing his redemptive plan. And that's where it gets really interesting. I especially like one place in the movie where uh, Gavin McLeod puts a family Bible down uh, because he's been discussing with uh, the others in the movie uh, whether they could find the date for the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. See, So he puts his family Bible down on the time machine. He sets it at 29 and he pulls a lever and it won't go. So he sets it back to 2080 and he pulls a lever and it won't go. So he sets it back to 2070 and of course you, you, you know what's the, the uh, possibility there is. Uh, what about traveling? into the future. You know, there are those in the Bible who actually went to the date of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we'll talk about them in this series as well, time travelers of the Bible. But Gary, it's not just a fantasy. Mm -hmm. There are experiments going on today in universities across this world attempting to travel through time. And I guess the first experiment that uh, came to our attention was a team of scientists at the Australian National University in Canberra who managed to teleport a stream of electronic data from one laser beam to another a few feet away. The Australian team used a process called quantum entanglement. They created two entangled laser beams of light. One beam was encoded with radio data and set over an optical fiber link while the other beam was sent into another direction across the lab. At the far end of the optical fiber, the laser beam was destroyed, while the other beam was monitored to read the values of its entangled photons. Just as the data was destroyed, it showed up in the other beam. It had been teleported from one beam to the other. Eureka, it worked. Mm. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And where did these people get their ideas? Well, uh, um, 
no doubt the original ideas about time travel come from the Bible because for literally millennia the Bible has spoken of the as yet unfulfilled future as though it had already happened. And, and this has set the imagination of, of, of man to, to turning. And uh, back in the 19th century, H.G. Wells wrote his famous uh, novel called The Time Machine, which really set the uh, tone for all subsequent novels. And J.R., there's something fascinating about H.G. Wells' novel. His time traveler went forward and discovered catastrophe and disaster. He, as he went forward through time, he found war, he found uh, increasing uh, struggle and, and until he came to a war that literally destroyed the world. And, and he was so frightened that he then uh, hit the lever and moved his machine thousands of years into the future and discovered that man had returned to a primal state uh, of ignorance and tribalism. And, and, and constant battling with uh, a degenerated form of future man, which brings me to this. When secular man speculates about the future, he, he always has a pessimistic view. He always says, oh, man is going to destroy himself. What can we do? What can we do? And he views maybe time travel as his way of rectifying the wrongs done by man, which actually brings us right back to a biblical theme. Yes, it does. In fact, uh, all of the themes for time travel come right out of the Bible. The prophets saw into the future. Now, there's um, a professor at the University of Connecticut, Dr. Ronald Mallett, who's building a time machine. And he claims that he uh, will be able to get it to work and he's going to begin experiments soon, this autumn, according to the Boston Globe. And he goes on to say that the professor and his colleagues plan to build this machine to test whether it's possible to transport a subatomic sub particle through time using a ring of light. Sounds like uh, Stargate, doesn't it? It does indeed. Uh, he hopes the energy from a rotating laser beam may warp the space inside the ring of light so gravity forces the neutron to rotate sideways with more energy. He thinks it's possible a second neutron would appear. This second particle would be the first one to visit itself from the future. Well, Gary, there are various ways of traveling into the future. Um, there are those who make, who bodily travel into the future, you know, and walk the streets of some future or some past. And then there are those who can look through a looking glass mm -hmm. or a television screen or a crystal ball or something like that. Like uh, the fortune teller, you know, in the seance room looks in this crystal ball and she sees what's going to happen tomorrow. Mm. Well... There are a lot of fanciful ideas about time travel. And by the way, J.R., those are forbidden in the book of Deuteronomy. Absolutely. That, that type of, of, of travel, if you will. This, this raises a question. J.R. and I have been talking about this question. Uh, if you could peer into a television screen, for example, that would allow you a view of the future, have you actually traveled to the future? And that may not be as, as easy a question to answer as you think. Uh, but there are uh, figures in the Bible who have tra act, traveled physically into the future, and they are well known to readers of the Bible. Yes, John in the book of Revelation traveled into the future. Ezekiel traveled into the future as well. And we'll be talking about them in detail uh, as uh, various uh, programs are developed. But uh, Gary, let's uh, talk for just a moment about the book you're holding there in your hand. Well, I have a book here entitled Beyond Einstein. Now, we're not offering this book. It's in the bookstores by Michio Kaku. He's a, a Japanese-American uh, uh, mathematician. He is said to be the inheritor of Einstein's uh, uh, theoretical uh, mind-bending mathematical tour de force uh, called the Grand Unified Theory. Here in his book, he goes all the way back to the discovery of electricity. J.R. Uh, people back in the 19th century, when electricity was discovered, they said, oh, this is against God. You know, oh, it's violating God's laws. And then electromagnetism, uh, which affected uh, something outside of itself, was thought to, this is 1860 when electromagnetism was discovered, it was thought to be well, maybe tampering with God's creation. Then there was the discovery of the atomic forces, the weak force, the strong force, uh, the grand unified theory that came out of Einstein's thinking. 
then, uh, in the 70s and 80s, uh, experiments in trying to discover gravitational waves have led to the superstring theory, and Michio Kaku writes about that. Well, JR read the article just a moment ago. The superstring theory is what this gentleman is dealing with when he's talking about quantum entanglement. So the question is, is time travel possible or impossible? A scientist there, and you have several books, uh, quoting leading scientists who believe that it is possible. Yes. When you look into the pages of the Bible, you know that it is possible. This book on the eve of Adam is mainly about Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10, where God says, I am God, there is none like me. I am God, declaring the end from the beginning. So God is able to travel to the end of it all, from the beginning. And from time to time throughout the Bible, he took various people with him to the end of time. Now, the most interesting date, of course, of all, is the date of the second coming of Christ. And uh, so there were a number of people that the Lord took and showed them all of history. Adam was one of those, wasn't he? He was indeed. And in just a moment, we're going to to follow uh, what Adam uh, saw and did and how that affected mankind subsequently. But J.R., there's a fascinating fact. Uh, if, you st- if you study the biblical view of time travel, you see a lot of people traveling into the future, but in the Bible you never see anyone traveling into the past. And I'm holding here uh, Stephen Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time, available in your local bookstore. We won't be offering this one. Uh, it is a uh, a book written by Br- the brilliant British mathematician uh, Stephen Hawking. He gets into discussion of time and he says, quote, a possible way to explain the absence of visitors from the future would be to say that, that the past is fixed because we have observed it and seen that it does not have the kind of a warping needed to allow travel back from the future. On the other hand, the future is unknown and open, so it might, might well have the curvature desired. In other words, we could go there, he says. I continue, this would mean that any time travel would be confined to the future. There would be no chance of Captain Kirk or the Starship Enterprise turning up in our present time. And then he says, uh, this may explain why we haven't been overrun by tourists from the future. Uh, because uh, it would be impossible to avoid problems if you traveled uh, back into the past. Suppose, he says, for example, you went back and killed your great-great-grandfather while he was still a child. Uh, Well, there are many versions of this paradox, but they are essentially equivalent. One would get contradictions if one were free to change the past, and then I have one final little quote from Stephen Hawking. The, the other possible way to resolve this, uh, the paradoxes of time travel, might be called the alternative histories hypothesis. The idea here is that when time travelers go back into the past, they enter alternative histories, which differ from actual recorded histories. And then he says, uh, the famous Marty McFly in his Back to the Future adventures, when he went back and, and created a situation that changed his mother and father's lives uh, went into an alternative history. Well, you can see what secular man is thinking when he considers time travel. It's almost facetious in a way, purposeless. When you look at what, uh, what God and the Bible says about time travel, there's always a purpose connected to it. Well, you know, uh, on the other hand, <laughs> this traveling faster than the speed of light is supposed to take you back in time. Yes. And that's what I've, uh, that's what I've heard. Now, um, Professor Crick um, of the Salk Institute out in California, uh, who discovered the double helix DNA, mm-hmm. Uh, decided that this DNA of ours is so complicated that it could not have evolved. But he is an evolutionist. He does not want to recognize the fact that there is a God or a creator. And so he came up with this idea that some travelers from the future, from some distant galaxy, brought the DNA from their time and traveling faster than the speed of light, of course they would have to travel faster than the speed of light to be able to get here in any uh, normal day of events uh, because you cannot travel billions of light years without it taking billions of years. Yes, that's true. 
unless of course you can travel faster so much faster than the speed of light you actually move back in time so they his idea was of course that time travelers or space voyagers came to earth brought dna seeded this planet with life <laughs> All of which is That's his... got to be from the future. Well, yeah, you know? from the future. All of which is his idea of, of saying there's no such thing as God. Yes. Uh, he likes to push God back into the uh, some kind of an ancient uh, past. Uh, you know, uh, J.R. read from Isaiah 46. Isaiah 48, uh, 3 says, I've declared the former things from the beginning, and they went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them. I did them suddenly, and they came to pass because I knew that thou art obstinate, and thy neck is an iron sinew, and thy brow brass. I have even from the beginning declared it unto thee. Before it came to pass, I showed it thee, lest thou should say, Mine idol hath done them, my graven image, and my molten image hath commanded them. God wants everybody to know, look, I declared the future so that you would know that I did it, not some idol. Not some guy here with an advanced degree in physics who builds a machine and goes into the future. God has a redemptive plan and purpose, and he reveals the future on a, shall we say, a need-to-know basis. He wants us to know, I did it. I declared that man will be redeemed. I declared my kingdom. So much more. You know, when a person travels into the future, God is guiding what he sees. God allows this to happen. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, most of the prophets went into the future to the day of the Lord. That is, to the very end of human history. And we're going to talk about Adam and what the rabbis had to say about Adam in just a moment. I want to mention to you that Pharaoh had a dream about seven good ears of corn and seven mm -hmm. bad ears of corn and seven good cattle and seven lean cattle. And Joseph came along to say that's a time event. There's coming seven good years followed by seven years of famine. And he was able to save back enough grain to feed everyone through those seven years of famine, which means that he affected time, at least our ability, a man's ability, to survive through. And he was not able to, to keep the famine from coming, but he was able to guide the people through it. I think that's an interesting uh, uh, hypothesis there. And again, it reveals that God uh, has a purpose when he allows this kind of vision. Uh, Adam, said by the ancient sages of Israel to have seen the future. Uh, in the moments following his sin, they say he was uh, allowed to examine the pages of future history to see whether there was anyone there who would be adequate to act as a leader bringing the world back to the state of perfection that God had originally intended before he sinned. And so say the ancient sages of Israel. This is, sounds like a fiction, but on the other hand, we know that, that this belief was very widespread in the old world because J.R. the sons of Seth are said by Josephus to have proceeded on the basis that Adam saw the future. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Josephus says, and that their inventions might not be lost before they were sufficiently known upon Adam's prediction that the world was to be destroyed at one uh, time by the force of fire, another time by the violence and quantity of water. And they made two pillars, the one of brick, the other of stone. They inscribed their discoveries on them both in case that the pillar of brick should be destroyed by the flood. The pillar of stone might remain and exhibit those discoveries to mankind and also inform them that there was another pillar of brick erected by them. Now this remains, writes Josephus, in the land of Syriad or Egypt to this day. And of course we know it as the Great Pyramid. Yes. And the idea being that Adam was allowed to see the future. He only lived to be 930 years. The sages say that he, he loaned 70 years of his life to David the king. Mm -hmm. 
And that's why he died 30, uh, 70 years shy of 1,000 years. 1,000. Uh, which 1,000 years, of course, equals a day. And this is God's plan. And uh, we have discovered that the Bible really is the source of information about uh, time travel. And by time travel, J.R., we're referring uh, not simply to going back and forth into the future in, and into the past. We're talking about uh, dimensional travel, that is, moving from one dimension to another. And the prophets of God, uh, many of them were privileged to move through the dimensions and to record what they saw there, and in so doing they actually became time travelers. There are a number of scientists, Gary, that have discussed time travel. In fact, they even think it's possible. Oh, absolutely, J.R. Uh, mathematicians today, and they're called quantum theorists. They're working with mathematics of such a high level that we can barely understand what they're talking about. Uh, Michio Kaku is one of them. Now, we're not offering these books. I just want to hold them up to show you. Hyperspace, Beyond Einstein. Here's one called How to Build a Time Machine. There's a very famous book by Stephen Hawking, who is an absolutely ingenious British mathematician called A Brief History of Time. And J.R., these men are writing uh, in an attempt to solidify their thinking about traveling through the dimensions. Some of them say we're on the verge of doing it. The only question is, uh, can we summon up enough power, enough kilowatts to make the jump? That's what they say right now. <laughs> And there are various ways of traveling through time. Uh, these people are talking about traveling bodily through time. Yes. H.G. Wells, in his famous novel, The Time Machine, talks about a man who bodily travels through time, ends up in the future. But there are ways of looking into time, say these uh, scientists, without actually going there, as if they were looking on a television screen. Well, you know, in the seance room, the crystal ball, the fortune teller gazes into that uh, crystal ball and claims that she can see into the future or oh, yes. he, whoever it might be. Uh, these are illegal methods of looking into the future, but I want you to know there is a God in heaven who preordained the future of this human race. And that's what we want to talk about today. Absolutely, because the number one thing you have to know about planet Earth in the opinion of, I believe, Bible-believing Christians everywhere, is that the timeline was first enunciated in the words of the prophets. And, J.R., the timeline is not whimsical, arbitrary, and capricious. It has a purpose. The purpose is called redemption. And God, to review uh, one of the things we talked about last week, told Isaiah this, Isaiah 46, 9, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is none else. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, I will do all my pleasure. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. J.R., the word for old here is olam in the Hebrew. That's the word for eternity. And, and the Lord says, Look, I designed eternity. It is mm -hmm. not arbitrary. It has a purpose. And I've told my prophets the, the purpose so that they can tell you and that you can become one of the redeemed. And that's the purpose. And he has laid out the history of the human race in 7,000 years. At least this is what the prophets mm -hmm. teach us. This is what Moses uh, told us. And the six days of creation plus the seventh day wherein God rested is a foreview of these seven millennia. Seven millennia. Now we're talking about a timeline here. Last uh, week we just barely mentioned the timeline of the gospel and the stars. We've talked about this many times in the past, but uh, J.R. Uh, has at his side a, a book by E.W. Bullinger called uh, The Witness of the Stars. And J.R., the, the Witness of the Stars really is what we're talking about here. It's a timeline. Indeed. Written in the constellations above, God laid it out, gave it to Seth, the son of Adam. I suppose he gave it to Adam as well. Mm -hmm. But Flavius Josephus, first century Jewish historian, said that Seth and his sons developed this science. And this is not astrology. But the devil came along and perverted mm -hmm. it. 
and used it for his purpose. And you know, of course, the astrologist today looks at the various constellations and, and tries to discern mm -hmm. the future in each individual life because of yeah, that. And just briefly, uh, J.R., tell us about what we see when we look into the stars. We, we see a series of figures that really talk about redemption, right? Yes, they are 12 constellations. It begins with Virgo the Virgin, ends up with Leo the Lion. Now, basically, Gary, this starts with Bethlehem and ends with the second coming. Mm. It's the first and second advent of Christ. There's nothing in the stars about the creation of Adam, nothing in the stars about the flood of Noah, nothing in the stars about Egyptian bondage or the law at Sinai. Mm. It all begins with Bethlehem and ends with the second coming of Christ. Wow, now that is the story of redemption. And again, as those stars turn, actually they don't. <laughs> They're stable. We turn and they pass by night after night. And as the constellations move uh, through the year, uh, we are really being treated to a kind of a celestial slideshow mm -hmm. to speak of the coming of Messiah the redemption of man. Uh, the Lord told Isaiah in Isaiah 48, uh, starting with verse 3, I have declared the former things from the beginning. They went forth out of my mouth, and I showed them. I did them suddenly, and they came to pass. J.R., he did them. Yes, that's the secret to the whole thing. God did them. That's the important thing. You see, the history of man is not just uh, one accident after another, one happenstance after another. It's all on a designed plan. If God has something come into your life that you may not particularly care for, he still has a plan. He has a plan for every individual. And, you know, it's amazing to me that God is able to bring this plan to pass. Hmm. Now, certainly you have a free will, but I don't know that now is the time to try to get into that because that would muddy the waters. What we're really looking at here is that God has a sovereign plan for your life. He has great hopes for you. He wants to redeem you. And that's the reason why everything happens as it does in your life, in my life, politically, in the lives of nations. Down through history, God has an elaborate plan. And you know, it's right on schedule, Gary. Absolutely, it is right on schedule. As we said uh, uh, formerly, uh, the Lord is the Lord of time. Uh, men talk about going through the dimensions today. Uh, Michio Kaku, in his book Hyperspace, and uh, in the next segment of the program, we're going to get into this a little more uh, in detail, uh, speaks of traveling through uh, the dimensional barrier, piercing the veil, if you will, that separates uh, mankind from eternity. And men want to do this in the worst way, believe me. But the Lord is the gatekeeper. That is to say, he's going to allow people to see on the basis of his plan and no other basis. I, I hate to tell Michio Kaku this, That's but, right. and all the other physicists, but the Lord's the gatekeeper. Yes. Now, there is a Satan, a devil, who wants to pervert God's plan. And he has been trying to do this down through the centuries, but he has absolutely been unsuccessful in doing it. Uh, he, for example, uh, has taken the gospel in the stars, God's plan from Bethlehem, uh, first advent to the second advent, and he has uh, brought them down to a, uh, a perverted religion called astrology, where they try to tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. You go to the... Uh, seance room, you know, and you ask the fortune teller, uh, will I do good? Who, who am I going to marry? Am I going to do good in business? What does tomorrow hold? And they try to tell you. But I want you to know all that is illegal, and it's just a perversion. It's just a made-up thing. God is the one who knows the future, and he laid it all out in the stars. That is true. The Bible gives us the future. It tells us of the whole history of man. And the reason... It does is because God planned it that way. Uh, the idea of just looking into the future or traveling into the future or traveling back in the past to affect the future uh, on, the be on behalf of scientists or mankind is absolutely impossible. God, however, can send his prophets into the future and when he does, 
It's for the development of his plan for the history of man. And we've already mentioned that Adam was given a complete outline of history by God. Now this is standard uh, Jewish teaching. It's recorded not only in Jewish writings of various kinds, but also in the history of Josephus. Uh, he's, he tells us that Adam was given a view of the future. Uh, and that future, again, not arbitrary, the future of redemption. Because Adam knew better than anybody else that humanity needed to be redeemed. And the Lord said, I'm going to send, send a man who will be a redeemer. That's that timeline. And, and J.R., the sons uh, of Seth, Seth being the replacement uh, for the deceased Abel. Uh, and Seth's uh, godly line leads all the way down to Abraham and beyond. And that godly line of Seth apparently listened well to Adam, and they heard uh, the story of redemption. And as Josephus tells us that they built two monuments, one of brick, one of stone, that in case the earth should be uh, destroyed either by fire or by water, that one of those monuments would, dis would survive. And the reason they did this was that they didn't want this story of God's timeline to be lost. I think that's most fascinating. You know, uh, what is interesting to me about all of this is that God had it all pre-programmed. Yes. Um, he knows the outcome. And when, uh, when Seth and his sons wrote into the stars, Virgo to Leo, the timeline from Bethlehem, they were 4,000 years before Bethlehem. Absolutely. 4,000 years before Bethlehem. There is nothing in the stars that they wrote about the flood. Nothing. Even though mm -hmm. they knew a flood was coming, it, it's not in the stars. Now, it is our belief that the sons of Seth built the Great Pyramid, which survived the flood, and there's good evidence for this. The Great Pyramid is a mathematical marvel. It's built to optical standards. It contains, uh, among other things, the distance from the equator to the North Pole of the Earth, the distance from the Earth to the Sun, the orbital period of the Earth is programmed right into the dimensions of the pyramid. Uh, oh, I could go on and on and on. Mathematical formulas like pi and phi, 1.618, are programmed into the pyramid. It's a mathematical marvel, Jr. It's a time machine. It's a time machine. <laughs> <laughs> won't take us into the future, but it will tell us about the past, won't it? Oh, it, it will indeed. Now, here's the thing. The flood came and went. Uh, men came down from the mountain. And Noah's sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, spread abroad. Men began to multiply on the face of the earth once again. In Genesis 11, we have a description of one of the things they did. Uh, when the whole earth uh, was uh, of one language, uh, Genesis 11:4 says, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And J.R., that tower was nothing more or less than a time machine. Over in the fertile yeah. valley around the uh, uh, Euphrates, they built this tower in defiance of God's tower. They wanted to be able to contact the devil and his Angels. They were after power. Yes. And they were trying to pierce this dimensional wall. The, the same thing that we're talking about that modern mathematicians are trying to do. And, and J.R., this is amazing to me. Genesis 11, 6, the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. That is a mouthful. The Lord watched what they were doing and he saw they're on the right track. You know, they are, they have enough knowledge, and a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. They had, but they had enough knowledge to pierce that dimensional wall, and that's what they were trying to do. Obviously, the Lord was not prepared for them to do that. So he uh, changed everything. He did change he changed everything. changed their languages. He scattered them abroad across the face of the earth and they left off to build a tower. Today, those scientists are trying to rebuild the Tower of Babel, so to speak. 
in so many words. So to speak, and to rebuild the Tower of Babel, all you really have to do is manipulate uh, the subatomic particles and energy flow in such a way that you can elevate uh, uh, a section or a portion of our present reality into the next highest state of energy, which is what they're trying to do. And, and, and here is Michio Kaku's uh, comment about this, JR, which I find most interesting. And Michio Kaku being one of the foremost theor theoretical mathematicians uh, alive today. Uh, he says, because uh, the hyperspace theory has opened up new profound links between physics and abstract mathematics, some people have accused scientists of creating a new theology based on mathematics. Now that's a key statement. He says the, the faith, the quote, faith in an all-powerful God is now replaced by the quotes, faith in quantum theory and general relativity. When scientists protest that our mathematical incantations can be checked in the laboratory, the response is that creation cannot be measured in the laboratory, and hence these abstract theories, like the superstring theory, can never be tested. He goes on to say, and this is the last brief quote, uh, he says, uh, there has been a recent uh, discussion uh, between representatives of the Roman Catholic Church and quantum mathematicians concerning uh, whether the Heisenberg uncertainty principle negates free will. J.R., there are actually debates now between science and religion about penetrating this dimensional veil. Uh, will uh, man's free will uh, be able to penetrate this veil, or do, is there some kind of a barrier that will stop man from going through the wall? Well, you know, there are all kinds of television programs, situations, where man penetrates, goes back, and changes the past. Yes. I recall seeing uh, uh, the uh, story of a of a of a uh, aircraft carrier mm -hmm. in the Pacific went through a storm. Yes. Their planes went through a time shift, went all the way back to Pearl Harbor, <laughs> and tried oh. to stop the Japanese, couldn't do it, and finally barely got back to uh, this time. You know, it's the Philadelphia experiment all over again. Well, this yeah. is what man wants to do. If man could, he'd go back and change God's plan. Absolutely, he would do that. And God is, of course, just as he was in Genesis 11, he's standing there and saying, oh, no, you don't. My plan is my plan. Now, <clears throat> uh, Moses, the great deliverer, uh, J.R. was, you talk about a time traveler. Now, uh, he was, because his, his books of Moses start with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You go all the way through Deuteronomy, and you come to a view of the future, the 12 tribes of Israel. It's amazing. And uh, Abraham, of course, uh, excuse me, Moses, mm -hmm. of course, came to the Mount of Transfiguration. That's a time shift. Oh, it is. And we'll show up again one of these days with Elijah during the tribulation period. And so he is going to be able to go to the end of days. And you know, the, the fascinating thing is that Jewish uh, teachers and sages tell us that in the books of Moses is encoded all of history, past, present, and future. The Vilna Gaon wrote, uh, the rule is that all that was is and will be unto the end of time is included in the Torah. End of time. Yes. You know, the disciples asked Jesus about the end of the world, and actually it's the end of the age. Yes. And uh, the, fascinating, the fascinating thing about this is you said that the scientists were talking to the Vatican about the free will of man. Yes. When it really boils down to it, we're talking about the sovereignty of God. Absolutely. Because God wrote the future. He has it all laid out in a perfect plan. Uh, we're talking about uh, the timeline of the Lord of Time himself. Uh, Jehovah is, we've been calling him the gatekeeper. His timeline is the redemptive timeline, starting uh, in eons past with the fall of Satan, uh, moving through Adam and Eve, and all the prophecies of the Messiah, and the second coming. That whole timeline has to do with the redemption but it also involves time traveler. <clears throat> we mentioned uh, the Jewish view of the books of Moses. The Vilna Gaon, uh, called the genius of Vilna, wrote this about the books of Moses. And by the way, he's expressing an idea that's common among 
the Jewish sages. And I quote, the rule is that all that was, is, and will be unto the end of time is included in the Torah, from the first word to the last word, and not merely in a general sense, but as to the details of every species and each one individually and details of details of everything that happened to him from the day of his birth to his end. In quote, the Vilna of Gaon. In other words, J.R., he's saying that time has been pre-written in the books of Moses. Basically, he's calling it the book of life, isn't he? Yes, he is. So here we've got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And this Jewish sage, many years ago, generations ago, said everything is written in the five books, one way or another, mm -hmm. not explicitly, but cryptically. It's all encoded there. Well, Eliyahu Rips and his uh, friends at the uh, Technion Institute in Israel uh, put a computer program together and began to search out uh, equidistant letter sequences and his premise is that the five books of Moses are a hologram, that they are more than just two-dimensional. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know exactly how many dimensions they have, but they say that the whole history of man can be seen in those five books. Fascinating It concept. is fascinating. And even at the surface level, and J.R. and I have brought you many studies on the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet from Aleph, which stands for creation, to Tav, which stands for truth and perfection throughout eternity. In other words, J.R., even the alphabet in which the Old Testament was originally written is in itself a reflection of this timeline of redemption. Now, 3,500 years ago, Moses was given the five books. They were dictated, not just word for word, but letter for letter by God. In fact, the rabbis say that when Moses wrote down these letters as dictated by God himself, the great timekeeper of all eternity, that God didn't uh, allow him to even make separations between the letters or periods at the end of the sentences. It just was a series of a string of letters. Absolutely. Now that's an interesting way of putting it. Oh, it is. Well, when it finally came down to uh, the codifying of these five books um, by, uh, I guess, un under, the, uh, under the direction of God himself, uh, the rabbis say that eventually, when Israel was born in 1948, the Hebrew year was 5708 in the Jewish calendar, they looked at the 5708th verse of the Torah, mm -hmm. and this is what it says, Deuteronomy 30, verse 5, And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed, and thou shalt possess it. 5708 in the Jewish calendar, 1948 in our calendar, it came to pass in 1948. That's got to be a time travel event. And all we're doing here is counting the verses, starting with Genesis 1-1 being verse number 1 and counting forward, and verse number 5708 or 1948 talks about the coming of the, of the Jews into the land. We're talking about a timeline of redemption. The Bible just shouts this message over and over again. You know, in the Torah, J.R., is uh, maybe the most important story. Well, it's hard to say that, but maybe uh, Genesis 14, beginning with the life of Abraham and his exploits and, and the, the visits that he has with God, an incredibly important story. And when you look at Genesis 14, you see another foreview of time. Yes. It's astounding. Genesis 14, 1 says, And it came to pass the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, that's Babylon, Ariok, king of Elisar, that's Greece, Kenilaomer, king of Elam, that is Persia, or the Persian Empire, and Tidal, king of nations, standing for Rome and Europe, that these made war with Bera, king of Sodom. Well, this brought Abraham into a war against the four kings. And J.R., the four kings are Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, looking forward in time. How can yes. such a thing be? This has to be a pageant of the future, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And uh, the interesting thing is Abraham here is a type of Israel. Well, Gary, tell us, 
How many years after the creation of Adam was Abraham born? Well, uh, 1,948, which is kind of a familiar number. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you understand what we're saying here? There is a time traveler who has put it all together. He has pre-written the history of man, all for the purpose of the redemption of mankind. So here he has Abraham, pardon me, his name was Abram, mm -hmm. being born 1948 years after the first man, Adam, was created. And he comes up then to this great battle of Armageddon, fighting against the forces of the world, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, the, the whole uh, scenario of the war was over Sodom and Gomorrah and their oil. So it was the oil of the Middle East that brought all these nations down against Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. And they took Sodom and Gomorrah people's captive. And then, of course, Abraham came to the rescue. That, that's the fascinating part of it all. The fascinating thing is that time seems to loop. That is to say, as, as uh, the trite saying goes, history repeats itself. There seem to be reverberations or loopings of future events that we see uh, uh, recurring over and over again, uh, anticipating the final outcome of those reverberations. Mm -hmm. And, and J.R., this just happens again and again. I think of, well, we could, we could spend hours on this. Let me just mention a couple more things about Abraham. Okay. His name was Abram, and God said, I want to change your name to Abraham, and I want to change the name of your wife, Sarai, to Sarah. God took the two He's from his ineffable name, mm -hmm. yod Hey vav He, Yahweh, and gave one to Abraham and one to Sarah. So we have one a uh, little miniature hay in mm -hmm. chapter 2, I think it's verse 4 of Genesis, seems to mark the beginning of the six millennia of human history. Yes. Marked there with a little time marker. We're talking time travel here. Oh, yes. Marked as a time marker right after God rests on the seventh day. The very next day, we've got this little hay. When we get over to Deuteronomy chapter 32 and uh, verse 6, we have an enlarged Hay, which marks the end, obviously, of six millennia, because he, uh, the very next verse, uh, verse 7 says, Remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. This is the 5,760th verse of the Bible, which corresponds to the year 2000 in our calendar. Now remember, we've already told you about 5708, 1948. Just come a few verses later, and you've got this big hay, and this reminder in the very next verse, look back over those past six days of creation and consider the years of many generations that they represent. 700 years ago, a Jewish rabbis wrote that that represents the six days of creation and the 6,000 years that are prophesied by these six days of creation. So we've got this time marker here from the days of Abraham. Mm. Most fascinating. But I think of Elijah being a prime yeah. example. Well, Elijah in his life foreshadowed the tribulation period. In my book on the eve of Adam, which is a time travel expedition through the great heroes of the Bible, I talk about Elijah, Ahab, and Jezebel. And I wrote on page 262, Elijah ministered during the reign of Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab appears to be a type of the Antichrist who compromised his Jewish heritage and married the wicked Jezebel, a type of mystery, Babylon. Elijah, Gary. Mm, Elijah. And, and by the way, Elijah was raised up specifically to go up against the prophets of Baal in the days of King Ahab. And, and uh, Ahab was an Israelite king who was uh, uh, greedy, he was power hungry, he was despotic, and he secured his throne by intermarrying with the royal house of Tyre, uh, the daughter of one of the kings of Tyre named Jezebel. And, and J.R., as we have studied Ahab and Jezebel in the past, they make a perfect typology of the Antichrist and Mystery Babylon the Great. In fact, uh, Jezebel was a priestess of Baal and represented that whole false religious system that has been growing up in the world system and will at last be destroyed as described in the book of Revelation. And so, here comes Elijah as standing against 
the Antichrist in type, if, in type, if you will, and Mystery Babylon the Great, or Jezebel. Fascinating story. And because of the way he played out his life, God was directing, evidently. Mm -hmm. God allowed him to be taken into heaven in a special machine designed and built in heaven called the Chariots of Israel. Yes, a Merkabah. <clears throat> Indeed, when he had finished his work uh, and he and Elijah were walking along, 2 Kings 2, 11, it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. J.R., that whirlwind that took him into heaven had to be a machine capable of taking him into another dimension. Well, as we've previously stated, when you go into another dimension, you ha automatically travel in time, or you leave this timeline, as it were, and go into a place where time becomes almost relative. And the next place we see Elijah is on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and Moses. Mm -hmm. so evidently, uh, he traveled into the future. Now, was he in heaven all this time just twiddling? Well, look, in heaven he is not in time. Yes. He is in eternity. He could have been, what, the next day. God said, I've got a little trip for you. Mm -hmm. Let's go down to see Jesus. And uh, then when they get back, it's very possible that the next day he says, now I want to send you down to earth for the tribulation period. So he it was. It could have easily been done that way, right? Oh, absolutely. And so in every respect, uh, Elijah was what we would call a time traveler, and when Peter, James, and John saw uh, Elijah standing there, they, I no doubt they saw him in the flesh, yes. in their own time. Now, at the end of the Old Testament, uh, we have Malachi's famous prophecy, Malachi 4, 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Well, J.R., that is still in our future. As, as we make this program, that's future to us. That's right. <laughs> you know, Jesus said something most interesting. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Hmm. Now, what did he mean by that? Was that some kind of cryptic statement? Obviously, Gary, he was talking about time travel. He was talking he was. about eternity and another dimension where time does not exist or is not relevant. And you remember a moment ago we were talking about loops of time or foreshadowings of time that rotate around. Well, in Elijah's uh, uh, first visit or his first placement within this timeline, he withheld the rain for three and a half years. And he's going to come back again in that future date, and guess what? He's going to withhold the rain for three and a half years at that time as well. Yes. So we have foreshadowings of ideas, uh, if you will, reverberations along the timeline. Yeah. Now let's talk about that, that uh, time machine he took off for heaven in. Mm -hmm. Now, it was obviously a celestial vehicle. I guess I shouldn't really call it a time machine, except that, Eli uh, that uh, Isaiah saw this same machine in chapter 6. He said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and so on. Yes. And the four cherubim around it. Then there was Daniel who saw the same thing. He talked about wheels on this uh, vehicle or throne of God or whatever it was that he saw with the cherubim again, these four living creatures that John describes in Revelation chapters 4 and 5. And uh, so he, Dan Daniel was given visions of the future as well. Absolutely. Uh, these vision, visions seem to be associated with these wheels of fire, if you will, and they are, according to Daniel chapter 7, the wheels are sent out as emissaries from the throne yes. of God. Now, you know, Gary, for all these people to be able to see these things and describe it, it has to be a real machine. It has, it yeah. has, it's not just a metaphoric something. Well, you know? and I don't believe it is a metaphor. I, for example, in, in the, the uh, book of Ezekiel, right at the beginning, Ezekiel is standing, he's looking out across the plain, uh, Ezekiel 1 4 says, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself. Mm -hmm. This would be a whirling type fire that's enfolding itself. We would call it this, I, I suppose, by the same uh, name we would call Elijah's chariot, uh, a chariot of fire. Yes. The Hebrew is Merkabah, or chariot. It, it is a vehicle. Maybe we could call it a celestial transportation vehicle. Why not? 
Well, Ezekiel describes this thing. It's got a canopy over it, a cockpit. Mm -hmm. It's got uh, wheels within wheels. It's got the uh, cherubim, by the way, are around it, and they are a part of the uh, uh, guidance system of this thing. And then, of course, these visions that Ezekiel has are absolutely uncanny. Uh, for example, when he talks about the Valley of Dry Bones over in chapters 37, um, that's, that is obviously a picture of the restored Israel, mm -hmm. which took place in this last century. In 1948, yes. Israel became a nation among the nations of the world. And you know, you've got all the six million bones, six, six million martyrs in World War II under Adolf Hitler's mm -hmm. regime. And, and then there's uh, all of the pogroms of Russia and, and so on. Uh, it's, it's obviously that Ezekiel saw these things. He went into the future. Then he describes the battle of Gog mm -hmm. and Magog. This is really something. And by the way, when, when Ezekiel describes the battle, uh, he does a couple of things. One, he describes Russia. It's, I think, virtually beyond... Uh, any kind of disputation that we're talking about an invader from the north being Russia. And J.R., he, he relates things as mm -hmm. though he's l actually looking at them, which I believe he was. I think he was taken to that time, given some kind of a celestial viewpoint, which means that he traveled to that point in time. Yeah. Now, the most interesting, I think, of all is chapter 40. When on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, 10th mm -hmm. day of Tishri, he comes to the city of Jerusalem in the future, and this is the day when Christ is coming back. In chapter 43, he describes him coming to the Mount of Olives. The glory of the God of Israel came. His voice was like the noise of many waters. The earth shined with his glory. That's the second coming of Christ. He describes Jerusalem as it appears today. Mm -hmm. He sees the frame of a city on the south. That's got to be the excavations uh, along the southern wall. Mm -hmm. He describes the eastern gate, which has a, uh, two gates. It's a double gate. Mm -hmm. Has a porch inside the gate. Stairs that go up to the temple grounds area. And that's exactly the way it is described today. Gary, this is an uncanny description of a time traveler. Absolutely. He did travel in time, but again, it was not an arbitrary thing. That is to say, it was not a joyride. The purpose uh, was that the God of Israel wanted everyone to know, look, I have a plan and a purpose. No matter how bad things look, no matter how deep the sin of Israel may be, no matter how strong the, the enemies of Israel may appear, I have a purpose, and I am going to fulfill my purpose. Now, if there was any date in the future that you would like to go and observe, what date would it be? What would be your date of choice? Mm -hmm. Would it be the day of the second coming of Christ? Well, that was Ezekiel's day. That's what John did in the book of Revelation. And J.R., the secular man would, would love to be able to travel through time. Uh, we have talked uh, about how uh, scientists are attempting to scale the dimensional wall. Uh, we've also spoken about how uh, true time travel, and the only example that we know of, uh, is only to be found in the Bible. And those travels are all into the future, and they are... Uh, accomplished by the prophets and the apostles for a specific purpose in order that God's redemptive timeline would be revealed to man. Well, when we get to the New Testament, J.R., that redemptive timeline really begins to unfold in a big, big way. And, of course, John is right in the middle of yes. it all. And in Galatians chapter 4, we have a statement about the coming of Jesus. It says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. And Gary, this is a time travel, in mm -hmm. the fullness of time. So yeah. God had marked everything, knew exactly the time when Christ would appear. As a matter of fact, if you go back to Daniel, uh, Daniel measures out weeks. Uh, and the 70th week is a very big part of Christian uh, prophecy. Well, the, the coming of Jesus fit within that time scheme given by Daniel. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus, uh, in turn, uh, prophesies to his disciples and tells them, uh, listen, what Daniel said is true. There actually will be something called the abomination of desolation. So he confirms a lot of Old Testament, uh, Testament prophecy. 
in Hebrews chapter 1, we have these, this awesome prose that says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Gary, there is dimensional travel, time travel, everything is here because he who came and was mm -hmm. born in Bethlehem was the same one who made the world. And amazing, and you know, I'm impressed over and over again by the fact that if we didn't have the Bible, if the Bible had never existed, I don't think man would even have the imagination to uh, think of the future as we do, or think of time travel because the Bible deals with it on a regular basis, and, and, and I think secular men have taken, taken the notion uh, of time travel and converted it to their own uses. Uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, and there you have the word beginning, uh, starting a timeline, mm -hmm. was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was the beginning with God. Now, this is what's interesting to me in terms of time travel. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. Life was the light of man, and the light shineth in darkness. The darkness comprehended it not. J.R., you know, this light, the primeval light of God, yes. is another dimension. Yes. And He came into this dimension of, uh, called metaphorically, darkness, and this dimension didn't understand Him. He came from that one to this one. And he voluntarily gave up his ability to, uh, to travel back and forth in time and locked himself in to the timeline for a period of some 30 years. Yes. This one who said before Abraham was, I am. Oh, Gary, this is really important that we understand that Jesus is one who lived outside of time mm -hmm. in an eternal state and visited us for the purpose of the redemption of mankind. One day, Jesus looked over the city of Jerusalem, Luke chapter 19, verses 41 and following. It's kind of interesting. Uh, chapter 19, verse 41, and I think of 1941, mm -hmm. 1942. He wept over the city of Jerusalem. He said, If thou hadst known, even thou at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. So there was a time visitation here, Gary. Mm. And, and Jesus here is prophesying because he can see into the future. He knows what's going to happen to the city of Jerusalem. And J.R., here is what's fascinating. As I'm listening to you read those verses, I'm thinking, uh, we study Bible prophecy. And when we do, what we're attempting to do is to understand Scripture in terms of God's prophetic timeline. Uh, the, big, the big date we have in our own era is the birth of Israel, 1948, which was yeah. foreordained, I'm absolutely certain. Uh, we grope for answers. We don't always get them, but I think the Lord wants us to look at the timeline. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about Paul in the third heaven. Oh, uh, yes. Paul uh, went, uh, well, actually, he was on his uh, missionary journey to Derby and Lystra. He was stoned and, they, and taken outside the city uh, uh, and left for dead. And, and J.R., when they left people f for dead in those days, the people really were dead because stoning is a horrendous way to go. And later, um, I think Paul is describing that event in uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verses 2 through 4, uh, where he says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body, I cannot uh, tell. Whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. And Paul's being very modest, very humble here. Such a one uh, caught up to the third heaven. 
And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, uh, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. This idea of the third heaven, the conventional explanation is that the first heaven is uh, the atmosphere, the second heaven would be the heaven of the stars, and the third heaven would be another dimension. Uh, so yes. Paul moved into another dimension, and J.R., I don't think it's any coincidence that, that, that when he returned, uh, in his, many of his later epistles, he wrote of the future. He knew that certain things would happen. And I think it's uh, probably not uh, stretching things to say that while he was in the third heaven, he learned certain things about the future that he was allowed to talk about. Other things, he says, uh, I'm not allowed to talk about that. This was an out-of-the-body experience? Uh, he says, I cannot tell. <laughs> yes. Which means that he traveled and he had fingers, he had legs, he sure. had feet, he had mouth, he had eyes, he had ears. He, could, he was mm. fully cognizant. Absolutely. And yet his body lay there crumpled beneath the stones outside the walls of Lystra. Absolutely. And when what he a... came back, he re-entered that body, and I'm sure he felt the pain oh. <laughs> as he woke up. Uh, but, it, but he was miraculously healed. He was raised up, and he went on uh, to complete the work that the Lord had for him. Uh, the, the amazing thing, like the prophets, like the other apostles, he was privileged to see glimpses of the future and pass them along to us so that we would know, so that we wouldn't be surprised by latter-day events. Yes. Now, here's this man, Saul of Tarsus, who was well-schooled in Judaism and who was a persecutor of the church. Upon his conversion, in which he saw Jesus on the road to Damascus, mm. he went down to Arabia and spent three years around Mount Sinai and received these tremendous revelations, which he talks about uh, in his epistles. This has got to be a dimensional travel of some kind. Even though, <clears throat> even though like outside Lystra, he didn't travel bodily, he still traveled into the future, into another dimension. Absolutely. He has to be called a time traveler mm -hmm. because any time you break that barrier, and again, uh, secular science is trying right now to break the barrier. They want to do exactly what uh, men were trying to do in Genesis chapter 11, build a tower to reach to heaven. Uh, and they want power, they want control, they want authority, they want dominion, but God's way is quite different. He, he wants redemption for man. The New Testament has some fascinating time travelers. Gary, I think John is one of the most prolific. Without a doubt, uh, John was the most spiritual of the disciples uh, in terms of his perception of, if you will, the other side uh, of heaven, the kingdom of heaven. Uh, he's called the disciple whom Jesus loved, he's, uh, meaning he seemed to be close to the heart of Jesus and the ideas espoused by Jesus. Uh, there's a beautiful example of uh, of what we're talking about when we mention time travel in the Bible right here at the end of the Gospel of John. When Jesus comes back, the resurrected Christ, and prepares a breakfast for the disciples, they have a wonderful time, <clears throat> and uh, uh, Peter uh, and John are close to Jesus, and Jesus has just told Peter a little something about himself, and Peter says, well, what about John? Uh, what do you have in mind for his future? And Jesus says... And that was, a, that was a future question, wasn't it? It was. What's going to happen in the future? And, and no doubt Peter knew that... Uh, that Jesus knew. <laughs> that, that Jesus knew. That's right. Well, uh, Peter says, what shall this man do? Well, in John 21, 22, Jesus saith unto, in, unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me saying here, in effect, <clears throat> Peter, what does it make uh, any difference to you uh, if it's my will that John stick around until my second coming? What difference does that make to you? That's between me and John. Well, this is an offhanded remark, seemingly, but actually it is not an offhanded remark. Isn't it amazing the way John uses this <laughs> right at the end of his book? Yes. Not over in chapter 10, not over in chapter 3. Right. But he uses it right here at the end because he's teasing us for his greater work 
the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yes. <laughs> and he says here, then when a sa went this saying abroad among the brethren that that, that that disciple should not die, refers to himself in the third person. Here. Yes. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? And he repeats that specifically, very carefully, very crafts carefully. his wording here, mm -hmm. he will tarry till I come. That is a time travel event. And J.R., here's the amazing thing. John actually did live to see the second coming of Jesus Christ. It's no metaphor. He lived to see it. Yes. He saw it from the island of Patmos. When Jesus appeared to him in Revelation chapter 1 as the glorified Savior and told him to write the things mm -hmm. which shall shortly come to pass. Yes. And to me, this, this is the greatest time travel extravaganza in the Bible. For 22 chapters, he carefully goes through the events of the tribulation period with the rise of world government, the rise of the Antichrist, the wars that will befall the war, the world uh, during this time, mm -hmm. and eventually the glorious second coming of Jesus Christ to put a stop to a man's, um, I guess, determination to destroy himself. Yes. And he sets up a kingdom, rules for a thousand years as king of kings. It's a absolute fascinating study in time travel. And what amazes me, J.R., is that the first three chapters of Revelation are messages to the historic church. After those three chapters are completed, the church is no more. We just put a period right there. Chapter 4 says, After this I looked and, be I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. Now, this is the door we've been talking about in all of our time travel studies. It's the door that secular man would like to open with all of his quantum physics and yes. so forth. He'd love to get over into that zone where he could travel around through time and space and be yes. the master of destiny. He's not going to do it. But John did go through that door. Now you know, Gary, if he had not written the seven letters to the seven churches, we would have no concept of 2,000 years of church history. That's right. And we would have no idea when he was explaining this, I was in the spirit of the Lord's day. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't understand that it was in the seventh millennium. We wouldn't understand that it was at the end of the church age. Right. And so we, ha we have a time sequence played out in the seven letters before he gets into this futuristic view. Now, J.R., it's my belief <clears throat> and I'm, I'm sure you have something of the same belief, that when the door was opened in heaven, John physically uh, was taken through the door. That is to say, in the same sense that Ezekiel was taken into the door of that fiery chariot, or Elijah was taken through the door of the fiery chariot carried to heaven, I believe that John was taken through a door physically. He went to heaven bodily, and when he did, he was able to travel into times that are yet future to us as we make this program. Now let me read something to you here. He says, immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one set on the throne. Mm -hmm. This is this vehicle that Ezekiel saw, Isaiah saw, Elijah yes, it is. traveled in. Right. That Ezekiel traveled in. John does not tell us that this vehicle came and got him all he said was, he looks up and sees this dimensional shift, this door in the fabric of the sky, so to speak, mm -hmm. and uh, heard a voice saying, come up hither, and suddenly he was there with that vehicle. Had to be the same kind of dimensional travel. Absolutely. Now, once he's there, he sees elders before the Lord. Well, that has to be future. Yes. It's a future ceremony. The taking of the seven sealed book is a future ceremony. It's future to us. John saw it with his own eyes. He saw the two witnesses, one of whom we believe is Elijah. And the other Moses. And, and then Moses. You know, both of them traveled in this uh, dimensional shift. Absolutely. 
And so what John is seeing is for him the present tense in his own body, but it's for us, it is the future. And I find that most amazing, and it really helps us to understand the program of God, I think. And you know, he came to Jerusalem, to the Temple Mount, and the Lord said, measure the temple. Mm -hmm. And the word used for temple there is a small sanctuary, not the grandiose temple uh, in the days of Solomon or even of Herod the Great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here's another thing. Uh, we see John reporting on certain geophysical events. Uh, we see him talking about the collision uh, of what must be asteroids, meteorites with the planet. We see the poisoning of the ocean by what must be a, a meteorite. We see geophysical upheaval, so much so that men are just absolutely living in stark terror. Huge earthquakes. In other words, uh, things that are yet future to us, he's reporting on as though he's there. Yes, and he sees the destruction of all the cities of the world yeah. in what he calls Mystery Babylon, the Megalopolis. And you know, Gary, in Isaiah 14, when Lucifer is cast down, there's a verse that says that they will look at him and say, you mean this is the man who destroyed all the cities in the world? Yes. That's an amazing statement there. It shows us that John saw the destruction of all these cities, perpetrated by Lucifer himself, Mr. Hell. Mm -hmm. And speaking of Mr. L, or Hell, yes. uh, he is uh, bound for a thousand years, and John actually witnesses this. So John did not travel just into what we might call our immediate future. Yeah. He was able to see a, a dramatic timeline. Uh, he, he reported on the millennium and actually referred to it as a thousand years, and he did this six different times. And you can secure your future by trusting in Jesus Christ. Do it today. This is J.R. Church and Gary Stearman. Until next time, keep looking up.